What actually happens when you click on a phishing link and get fished? What does the attacker see? What does the attacker do and how do they do it? In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how easy and how quick it is for hackers and scammers to steal accounts with phishing attacks. So I'm going to show you a look under the hood. This is a billions and billions of dollar industry. In 2022 alone, they made $40 billion off of just Americans. That's as much profit as JP Morgan and Chase in 2024. It's insane. Every year it grows and it continues to be one of the biggest attack surfaces, attack vectors that we see in cybersecurity. I'm going to show you two examples of how a real life phishing attack occurs from start to finish. So first, let's steal a Google account, right? Very valuable. Everybody's got a Gmail. Everyone has a Google account. As an attacker, the first thing I need to do is build up some infrastructure. I'm using this random tool that I found on GitHub, Cred Harvester by King Sabri, Sabri, shout out. So I'm in a VM on Kali Linux, and this is gonna be our attacker's server, our attacker's infrastructure. All I had to do was change a few small lines of code in the Ruby script, and then provide an HTML file of whatever site I want. It could be a site that I create. I could make a custom one. I could go out and clone a new website, like clone a banks or a governments. Don't do that. Do not do that. Do not do that. And like I said, we're going to steal a Google account. So we need the HTML. We need the website. We could go out and try to copy Google's. But what I've done is go and pull another free resource out there on GitHub, extra phishing pages from Wi-Fi Fisher five years ago. And once everything is set up, I'll start my server. You can see Creds Harvester has been launched. And you can see if I go to my local machines, port 80, boom there you go we're already pretty far in we've already got the sign in page it looks pretty good right and the next thing an attacker would do is set up a domain they would go buy some website to put it on the public facing internet so they can send that out as a link and if i was trying to steal a google account i'm gonna go buy a domain like this you know something with google in the name i'll maybe put security alerts to give it some legitimacy so people who aren't really paying attention don't really think anything of it you can see there you go eleven dollars a year super cheap i could buy it right now boom there you go you can see a request was made and you can see I'm at security-alerts-google.com. They may make that domain completely random or they may try and make it actually believable. Like using a zero instead of an O, that'd be like typo squatting. What's going to happen is anytime a user tries to log in, they're going to get fished, right? So if I log in with my real Blake White at gmail.com and my super secret password, boom, there you go. You can see exactly what just happened. A few things happened there, right? So on my attacker server, you can see I got a hit. So a username, a password got logged, it got sent to me. But you also notice that as the victim, I got redirected to a myaccount.google.com protect your Google account site. This is one of the clever tricks they use in phishing attacks to hide their tracks, to kind of cover their tail. Because now as the user, if I notice something was up, I'm actually at a google.com website. I'll probably just think, oh, it was an error in Google's site. I just need to sign in again, right? So now as an attacker, I've got my infrastructure. All I have to do is get a belief believable email, get something that people will click on. I just went to my email, looked for an actual Google email, and here you go, a new sign on, check your activity, my Google account. All I had to do was take that HTML, make a couple modifications, right? Just change the links, that's all I had to do. I threw in a little something, hey, by the way, the guy who's logging in, he's in Moscow, Russia. The user's gonna get this like, oh, I'm not in Moscow, Russia. I'm worried. And usually what happens, it, it creates that sense of urgency, right? So I'm coming from Google. That's kind of some trust and authority. And I'm adding, hey, there's a sign on. It's a security issue. It's coming from Moscow. Like there's some urgency. They might get worried and their judgment gets a little off so someone is more inclined to click this link because of the pretext and the pretense that i've set up and what happens when you click check activity oh that's expected right if i'm going to check my account activity i need to sign in and let's say the user actually does type in their username and password and they sign in Boom. And it's actually pretty slick, right? They get redirected to an actual google.com website. By the time they're here or by the time they're at this page, they're already at an actual official google.com website. So that's how the attackers can use redirects to kind of cover their tracks. At this point, they've already signed in. As the attacker, I've already got their username. I've already got their password. And now I can go use this. I can impersonate them. I can get in their email. I can steal their account. I can lock them out. Whatever I'm gonna do as the attacker. At this point, you might say, oh, that's, that's cool. That's a really cool tool. But hey, guess what? I've got MFA. I've got two factors of authentication. And even if I did give you my password, 
you couldn't compromise me because you need the second factor. Isn't that going to protect me? Yes and no. It'll definitely make your account more secure, but it's not going to fully protect you from a phishing attack. So next, we're going to look at a second tool that is capable of compromising accounts even when they have MFA. It's a different style or technique of phishing attacks, more commonly known as a man in the middle attack, an MITM or AITM for attacker in the middle. You could also call it session hijacking or cookie hijacking. And this type of attack allows us to bypass multi-factor authentication. So in our first example, right, we just put up a website and say, hey, come here, log in, come to this page. And this man in the middle, MITM attack, we're actually not gonna host any website. We're actually just gonna sit in the middle. We're gonna be a man in the middle and we're just gonna directly pass on messages back and forth from the user and the legitimate real website. This is crazy, right? So for this attack, we need to grab one file. It's worker.js from this AITM worker, GitHub repo made by some great people at Zolder, applied security security research credit where credit is due. We'll make a few adjustments, go to workers and pages on Cloudflare. This is all free. And Cloudflare will actually host this JavaScript serverless for you and give you a domain name. I did create a real life Microsoft tenant that I can use for testing. As you can see, I've got an account, an admin account. I'll log into my admin account in my test tenant. And you can see I even have MFA and boom, there we go. We're at the actual office.com. You can see I'm logged in as admin at Blake White on Microsoft.com. So I've got a whole legitimate tenant and I'm gonna demonstrate a business email compromise to you. So for example, again, I'll go and grab a legitimate Microsoft email. So I've got my phishing email. I've got my web hook set up. I send out this phishing email, Microsoft account security code. It's a kind of similar thing like, hey, you're signing in, here's your code. By the way, the location is Russia. I'm not in Russia. Let me log in immediately without thinking and take care of this and protect my account. And what happens, it says, okay, if you didn't request this, click here to protect your account, right? A user is gonna click there and look at this. On the right is the actual legitimate Microsoft login. You can see by the URL. And then on the left is mine, right? That Microsoft dash security at yada da that we created and we're hosting on Cloudflare. They're identical. And that's because they are identical. We are sitting in the middle as a direct proxy. So we request the page from Microsoft, comes to us, we serve it to the user. What happens next is the user is gonna type in their email, they'll type in their password, we'll send that off to Microsoft, and boom, there you go. You can already see in my team's webhook, we've already captured the username and the password. We'll send it to Microsoft, Microsoft will reply and say, hey, this account has MFA, do the challenge. We'll forward that challenge and I'll do the challenge on my phone, do my face ID and boom, there you go. Let's say I wanna hit yes to stay signed in. Now I'm at office.com. So again, with the redirect. So we got the plain text username and password for the account. But what's really interesting is we've got the cookie. We've got the authentication token from that user's browser. So what we can do, so let's say we wanted to get into the user's email. Their account has MFA. We can't just do the username and password. We'll try to log into office. It's gonna prompt us. But now that we have the cookie, what we can do is copy that out, use something a little clever to inject this cookie into our browser as if we had that cookie. We import it. Now all we have to do, watch this, is refresh. And boom, now I'm in that user's email. I'm authenticated as that user. You can see I didn't sign in. I didn't do the username, password, MFA. We injected the raw cookie, the session token, and now we are effectively that user. We can log into their email, log into their Microsoft Entra, their Azure. We can do anything that that user can do. We can now impersonate them and steal their identity. So now we just successfully fished an account that even had 2FA. And it might not be this exact tool, right? This was something that was free, simple, quick, easy, but there are much more advanced, much more expensive tools out there that are much more developed and capable that attackers use to fish at scale. And this is a realistic example of how business email compromise attacks happen. They compromise the email, even 
if it has MFA, which they don't always. Now they can impersonate the user, they can change the payroll, they can send invoices. Now that they've compromised someone's identity, they can now leverage that insider trust they have because they have a real employee's email, they have their credentials and privileges. And this is how we see companies get scammed out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, out of millions and millions of dollars. But the good thing is with the majority of phishing attacks, the attackers are really going after the lowest hanging fruit, the lowest barrier to entry, casting the widest net possible and seeing what comes back. They're very opportunistic and that means you don't have to outrun the bear, you just gotta outrun the guy next to you. So don't get caught looking silly, turn on MFA, look at the links before you click them. Thanks for watching. Thank you.